And so I said, George, how can you sit there and say that? Take a look at the shape of our schools. Take a look at the funding for science and all the things that are, are important. How can you say that you can't figure out why I'm not here? He said, easy. If I had to cast a vote on weapons, the NRA is at my door. If I have to cast a vote on medicine, the AMA is at my door. If I have to cast a vote on education, there is silence. If I have to cast a vote on science, there is silence. So therefore, for me and my colleagues, silence says everything is okay, we don't have a problem, we don't have to pay any attention to it. We begin to change that. And I argue that scientists, society must engage in a dialogue. I want to thank you for your attention. And I want to acknowledge my countless lay friends who always remind me that they pay the bills. My former colleague from the Physics Resources Center at AIP, who kept me honest most of the time. <laughs> and from the National, for the National Science Foundation, at whose trough we all feed. And none of these pieces could have been made without their help. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. And we have time because our speaker was so nicely timed uh, for a few questions. The physics community is uh, taking responsibility now for teaching bringing science literacy to the teachers, especially uh -huh. the, uh, the uh, physics the physics community is taking responsibility for bringing science literacy to the teachers these days, especially the K through eight teachers who have brought in all that science literacy in the past. I'd sure like to see an effort to do the same thing with I think an equally important community and that's the journalists. Do you see us really taking responsibility for the journalism community? It's not clear that we are taking responsibility, but there is a dialogue uh, between scientists and journalists. But every time I hear that, I'm reminded of roughly 15, 20 years ago uh, when I had my first conversation with uh, TV, well, these were print uh, uh, media. And uh, and I'm talking about the need for the media to get on board and help us tell the story of science. And one of them looked at me and said, Jim, let's get this straight. My job is to sell these papers. And I will do what I need to do to sell these papers. Now, I need you as a source. And I will come to you and I will talk to you uh, and, get, and get information from you. And I will do as much as I can with that to be truthful to your source. Because if I'm not, um, you'll stop talking to me. But don't expect me to run it by you before uh, I run it. And if I call you at 11 in the morning, and you call me at 5.30 at night, I don't want to even talk to you because my deadline has passed. And so those are the kinds of things that we need to learn as we start talking to the media. <clears throat> now, in one piece I forgot to say was in producing these people and these pieces for TV. As scientists, we said, it's got to be accurate. It's got to be precise. It's got to be correct. And so we call it the only peer-reviewed news pieces on TV. <laughs> What's the peer review? You get the idea, story idea, you write the script, and then you send it out to uh, reviewers. What reviewers know is that I do a 24 hour turnaround. And so when it comes in that box, they stop what they're doing, 
They read it and they go, yay, nay. If it comes back, nay, it's killed. If it comes back, yay, you go with it. But we've had to talk to scientists about changing the way they look at things. What am I trying to say? We have got to start having a dialogue. And people at newspaper stations would love to have a dialogue with you. That's not going to do that. I'm afraid we're going to have to let that be the last question, but Jim is going to uh, be around, and I'm sure you can buttonhole him further. We're going to continue along our theme of communication. Actually, let's thank Jim. Webster.